all sand. Please be seated. Yes, Ms. Finney. Um, Your Honour, a letter was received overnight from those acting on behalf of various church parties, and the uh, letter is uh, relevant to the matters that Your Honour raised yesterday with Mr Gray and the interpretation of particularly paragraph 67 of the practice guidelines. And in order for this matter to be addressed, I seek to tender that letter. Mark it as an exhibit. I like it. <coughs> exhibit 2819. Sorry, on 28. 2819. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Your Honour. You um, don't want to say anything further in relation to it. I beg your pardon, Your Honour. You don't want to say anything further in relation to the letter? Uh, well, you know, I, as I indicated yesterday, uh, my submission is that section 67B uh, can be, and in my submission should be, interpreted differently from that um, set out by those representing the church parties yesterday. And that matter is raised in the second page, about halfway down of this letter. And it's suggested in this letter that in the circumstances of the Royal Commission taking a different view, contact was made overnight with some of the people concerned, including Cardinal Pell. And what's attached to the letter is a statement from Cardinal Pell where, among other matters, in respect of Mr Green... He says the conversation that Mr Green gave evidence of yesterday did not happen. And in respect of the evidence Mr Ridsdale gave yesterday, he says, I have previously made a sworn denial of these allegations and I reiterate that denial. Uh, now, no other material has been provided in the context that the church parties referred to some of the people, including Cardinal Pell. So my submission can only be in respect of Cardinal Pell. And uh, in my submission, the, that statement which has been provided to the Royal Commission uh, is one of denial rather than difference of recollection. And in my submission, uh, the contents of that statement would call into play paragraph 67A. So the issue of whether or not paragraph B of 67 should be read in a particular way becomes somewhat redundant. Yes. Mr Gray, do you want to say anything about this letter? No. Your Honour, the letter um, speaks for itself and that, that is our position on my instructions. Well, I just need to say a couple of things. Firstly, the letter uh, has, it would seem to us within it, a misunderstanding. Um, as Ms Finesse has just indicated, um, the position as we apprehend it may be is that there will be direct conflict uh, between witnesses as to whether or not a particular event occurred or a particular statement was made. Um, either, because, <clears throat> either because there's been a mistake or because one or other may not be telling the truth and should be disbelieved, then the 
then both limbs of Clause 67 will operate. Now, maybe that hadn't been appreciated, but um, it should be clearly understood. Uh, uh, we, no, I'm sorry. Now, sorry. I'm sorry. Now, secondly, um, the letter raises the question of the process that's been followed by the Commission in previous case studies. Nothing which we have done in order to progress the case studies, the public hearings, in an orderly way diminishes or cuts across the right of any party to seek to have evidence tendered or a witness called. It's not uh, alone a matter for the Commission to seek out uh, evidence or seek out witnesses. If a party uh, wishes evidence to be called um, or evidence to be tendered or a witness called, then that is their right and that right is exercised by asking council assisting to make appropriate arrangements for that to happen. Um, however, um, in the ordinary course, in order for the orderly running of the Commission's business, it is, uh, has been our, uh, our um, approach in the past and will continue to be that we will seek out um, witnesses and seek from them statements so that, as I say, we may proceed in an orderly fashion. Um, the fact that uh, prospective witnesses in this case study have not yet been asked for a statement is a reflection um, of two things. Firstly, as with any Royal Commission process, we are engaged in an investigation. This is not a process akin to a conventional trial when all the evidence is necessarily collected before the case begins. This is an investigation. And as you know, and everyone knows, uh, this case study is proceeding in, uh, by way of two separated public hearings. No one should assume that um, that's been done for other than a deliberate purpose. Um, and I stress again, this is an investigation. That's what a Royal Commission does. Um, thirdly, Mr Gray, I need to confirm, if it's not already plain, that just because the church parties have chosen to conduct their case in any of our case study hearings in a particular way and not ask witnesses questions um, is not a matter um, that we uh, will have regard to when making any findings that we believe is appropriate to make when we complete our reports. It's a matter for, for you and those instructing you as to the course that you take. Um, but uh, the uh, practice directions and what I've indicated yesterday and confirm again this morning, I hope, makes plain that merely because the church chooses to conduct its case in a particular way, that does not bind the Commission in any way at all in relation to the approach it will take to the findings which it might make. Thank you, Your Honour. Um, uh, we've done our best to put forward our appreciation of the position as it presently stands in the letter, and I've heard what Your Honour has said. Well, what, what I'm saying plainly is the letter is not, um, uh, does not reflect what um, uh, the process for the Commission or the process by which the Commission uh, will uh, pursue its task. Um, and it would seem that there's been some misunderstandings uh, that are reflected in the letter, and I trust those misunderstandings have now been swept away. Could I ask us to ask one question, Your Honour, in case there's another misunderstanding on my part? Is, is the Commission indicating that findings would be made before the second set of hearings? No, of course not. No. Uh, it's one investigation, one case study proceeding by way of two sets or two periods of public hearings. Um, I, I stress again, as I stressed yesterday, that no one will be denied procedural fairness, but that doesn't mean that the investigative process won't take the course which the Commission has decided should take. All we will do is make sure that, that at the end of the day and before we make any findings, everyone has been afforded procedural fairness. Thank you, Your Honour.
Ms. Finnis. Can I just raise one additional matter in relation to uh, the letter? In, which is now Exhibit 2819, uh, there is reference to the fact that the church parties were provided with witness statements after witnesses associated with the church parties had already provided their statements, with one exception. Now, the word after is underlined, and I can only take that as being somewhat of a criticism of the process followed. And as council assisting, can I indicate that the way in which material is served on the parties depends upon the stage at which any investigation has reached and there is no set practice that will be unwaveringly followed in respect to the service of material. Yes, thank you for that. And, um it just leads to me to repeat the observation that this is an investigation and the process by which that investigation is undertaken is a matter for the commissioners. At the end of the day, the necessity and the obligation of the commissioners is to afford parties procedural fairness. But that does not mean that in the course of the investigation any particular uh, pattern or uh, internal procedure will be followed. What it means, though, is that at the end of the day, and before we make findings, procedural fairness, an opportunity to respond and make submissions is afforded to any party. Yes. Your Honour, I call Paul Tatchell. Can I indicate that Mr Tatchell uh, does not wish his uh, face to be streamed and therefore it will not be, but he will give his evidence um, from the witness box? and clearly can be seen by all in the hearing room, but not those outside. You take an oath on the Bible or open the Bible? Take that in your hand, please. Repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God... I swear by Almighty God... ..that the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission... ..that the evidence that I shall give in this Royal Commission... ..shall be the truth... ..shall be the truth... ..the whole truth... ..the whole truth... ..and nothing but the truth... ..and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Take a seat. And Mr Tatchell, you provided a statement to the Royal Commission dated the 12th of March. That's correct. And in addition, you have recently provided a two-page addition to that statement? That's correct. Now, the contents of your statement true and correct? Yes, they are. I tender the statement, Your Honour. We'll, we'll bring together both the statement and the supplement, if that's appropriate, to make them... Exhibit 2820. Thank you, Your Honour. Now, Mr Tatchell, there are some uh, paragraphs which have been blacked out and some other words which have been blacked out in your statement. That's correct. When you read that statement, uh, can you read around the blacked out area? Yeah, no problem. Thank you. And can I invite you to read your statement omitting paragraphs one and two, which are formal paragraphs? No problems. Thank you, Mr Tatchell. Uh, my name's uh, Paul Edward Tatchell. I was born in uh, 1961. I'm 53 years old. I'd just like to correct the record. My records show that I'm uh, 55 and that uh, I was born in 1959 due to my military service and my uh, need to go to the military at 15. I was born in Narry Warren, Victoria, one of five children. I'm the second oldest, two boys, three girls. I had a fairly ordinary uh, family background. My father was uh, fairly violent towards my mother and I. When I was about six or seven, we were temporarily living in Malvern, Victoria, although we were country people, we were down there. I shared a room with my younger brother who died of influenza. At the time, I tried, I tried to wake my brother up and uh, my father... Uh, just yelled at me and assumed that I had something to do with it. 
My father never really got over it and our relationship was uh, pretty ordinary. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, uh, but when I was at home, it was probably about uh, uh, beltings between my mother and myself. Uh, St Patrick's College, in 74, I was sent to St Patrick's College uh, Christian Brothers School in Ballarat as a boarder. We'd moved around a lot when I was a child. By this time, I'd been to uh, nine primary schools in Victoria. I went to reception and was put in the care of an older boy who took me straight to my dormitory. I was introduced to Brother Paul Nangle, the headmaster, who was a Christian brother. Brother Nangle allowed me to speak to uh, Brother O'Malley. He was about 90 years old and not well. He had no idea who I was and uh, I had uh, no idea why I was there to see him. The dormitory I was put in had around 40 kids from Forms 1 and 2. Uh, when I got to the dormitory, it was fairly crowded, as uh, most of the boys had arrived by the time I got there. The beds in the dormitory were about two feet apart. I was introduced to a, a, a brother, Ted Dowling, who was a dorm master. He was a funny little bloke who appeared nervous and sweated a lot. He introduced me to another boy and told me to find a locker and a bed. I remember being uh, rather puzzled by uh, Dowling dressed. It was in the middle of summer, it was very hot, and he was in his tunic, and he looked pretty uncomfortable. Uh, Dowling knew a large percentage of the other boys in the dorm. There was a mixture of kids from Form 1 and Form 2, and uh, most of the boys had been there from the year before from Form 2. I then got my blanket sheets from a bed, and uh, about 5 p.m. we all went to tea. I didn't have a tour of the school, nor was I shown around. Uh, the older students showed us what we had to do. I think school might have, uh, have already been started by the time I arrived at St Pat's, and uh, I didn't have much gear or anything. Uh, and I was uh, put into a bed at the very start of the dormitory. At about 6.30, we went back to the dorm, and lights out, whereas was at 8.30 traditionally at night. Uh, on my first night at St Pat's, I didn't sleep. No sooner had the lights gone out when I seen Dallin walking between the beds, stopping from time to time, leaning over at certain beds, whispering softly and appearing to be kissing the boys. Every time Dallin walked near my bed, I crawled under the covers and I remember uh, shaking nervously. After observing this, I maintained a permanent watch over the next couple of weeks to try and ascertain which beds he was stopping at, but it was difficult in the dark to pinpoint accurately. By this time, I'd already swapped beds with another boarder and moved down closer to the locker room at the end of the dormitory near the window. So it was difficult for, for Dowlin to walk past my bed on a regular basis. I thought to myself, well, if anything happens, I'll just uh, get out of here and I'll take off. I suppose I realised from the first night that there was something fairly odd happening with Dowlin, and to this day, I don't know what made me nervous as I was, uh, but I was immediately suspicious of him. But I trusted my instincts and tried at all times to stay clear of him. After several weeks, I was sleeping better, became more settled. Although I kept a fairly low profile, I managed to get to know some of the other boarders and I felt a bit more comfortable in Dallin's dormitory. This was up until uh, about the middle of March 74 when I was having a shower washing my hair, and I had uh, feeling that I was being wash, watched. It says washed here, but it should be watched. I quickly uh, washed the soap from my eyes and turned around to find Dowlin, standing about two feet away from me, staring at me. He was looking at down an area where my bum was. He looked a bit startled, and I turned around and looked up at his face. 
He stepped back at the time and I grabbed my towel. I said something to him. I don't know what I said. I don't remember what I said at the time. That night, Dowlin told us that we were not allowed to take our towels into the shower and they had to be left in the locker room because we were spending too much time drying ourselves after showers and other boarders were being held up. At school, I was a bit of a loner. I didn't make friends. I didn't particularly want friends. I kept to myself and probably made it very clear to people that uh, I just wanted them to stay away from me. I didn't particularly like Dowlin and he didn't particularly like me. He uh, was a very impatient man with a very short fuse. I rarely answered to him if he spoke to me and I would ignore him. I was pretty much like that with everybody. I was uh, good at school though and I enjoyed the learning. Because my family was 200 miles away in the Western District, I didn't go home for the holidays like the other kids. I was the uh, only kid there. St Patrick's became my home and I was at St Pat's for nearly a year in total. I remember Dowlin being very cold towards me for a couple of weeks after the shower incident. Nearly every night during showers he seemed to make a point of stopping to chastise me for something that I may have done during the day, no matter how trivial that was. It could be about homework or uh, lights, talking after the lights went out or eating me dinner too fast or whatever. Dowlin would lecture me for a while and get himself all worked up. When he was worked up, he'd go red in the face and the sweat and the saliva used to gather around the corners of his mouth. When, when he was finished lecturing me, he would walk straight away and he would stand and stare before moving on. Stand and stare before moving on. Punishment in the dormitory was fairly unusual. Dowlin had three weapons. One was a rubber gat, about 14 inches by an inch wide and about half inch thick. The second was a leather strap, 24 inches long, two inches wide and about a quarter of an inch thick. Uh, not unlike uh, leather belts sewn together. The third weapon was a cane whip about three foot six long. Punishment was always done in the seclusion uh, at Dowlin's bedroom at the end of the dormitory. Almost uh, always you were punished after lights were out. Every night uh, you just line up at the dormitory, he'd call your name and when the lights go out uh, you'd get a hiding from him from in front of the room. Uh, Dowlin would call in the first victim after he punished the last one, uh, sorry, after he was punishing. Uh, and then he would go to the bed of the next victim, victim and the state of the process would go on and uh, you would get an extra six hits for not going in his room. I didn't think much of it at the time and I, and I would just stare him down. I wasn't a big bloke at the time, but I was strong. I knew from uh, my experience with my father what a real flogging was and uh, I figured the strap made me strong. Every time someone hit me, I thought, yeah, go on. I suppose I took solace in the fact that I could walk away from a beating with a smile on my face and stare them down and tell them you're not going to hurt me. No other brothers disciplined like Dowlin. They all did it up front. By this I mean he got the strap right there and then, be it in the class or wherever. The problem with Brother Dowlin and his punishment at night is his, his room was, uh, you never knew if you are going to be the victim or not, or only if you were even going to be called. You just lay there and waited. The normal punishment was six on the hands uh, with any of the weapons, but then they got to six on each hand and uh, six on the backside were possibilities. When I got six on the uh, backside, you had to take your pyjama pants down and your underpants down. If, uh, if you're wearing underpants, you got an extra hit because Dowland did not allow us to wear underpants to bed. This happened about once a fortnight, probably more common than that. And it uh, was usually for something that you hadn't actually done. On two occasions, I received 23 all uh, at once. And uh, there were also occasions where uh, he would change his weapon midstream. Uh, you didn't feel much after the first one anyway. On one occasion during the second term, I was going down the music room to see Brother Ring, the music teacher. I opened the door to see Dallin. He was there with another student. The other student was uh, sitting uh, below Brother Dowlin on the steps uh, where the band or the choir performed. He was giving Brother Dowlin, and I'd just like to say here what appeared to be oral sex. It says oral sex, but I'd say it's what appeared to be. I said something that I can't remember. He got up and flew into a rage, telling me that I uh, should not have been there, 
and it was not a music period. He then came down, grabbed me and pushed me out of the room. Later that evening, Dallin called me into his room and gave me six on the end, on each end. We argued about whether the punishment was justified. Then Brother Dallin approached me, put his hands on my face and apologised. I pushed him away and returned him a bed. Brother Dallin was noticeably aggressive towards me from that day on, and I too became aggressive towards him. I noticed Brother Dallin would prey on certain types of boys, boys who had trouble settling down, the unspoken boys with behavioural problems. He didn't appear to be interested in mixing with stable students. One night in September, November of 74, at about 8.30pm, Dallin opened the door to his room and called out, Tatchell, come here. Then he shut the door again. I stood outside the room and waited until the door opened and he told me to come in, which I did. He then closed and locked the door. He said, put your hands out for the strap. I said, look, I've got nothing. I've, I've done nothing wrong. What's this for? We well, then had an argument about it. I wouldn't put my hands out. He eventually pulled my hands out and he hit me. And I was trying to hit more, but a lot of the hits were missing as I resisted by trying to pull my hands away. I called him a bastard. And at this time I was angry and I was fuming. I was upset. Brother Dallin sat on the edge of his desk and I was about two feet away. He then put his hands up and tried to pull me closer. His face was against my head and I pushed him away, calling him a bastard. I unlocked the door to his room, walked out and went back to bed. I then went to sleep and woke up with him stroking my head and pulling the blankets off. He leaned down to kiss me, so I grabbed him and said, go away. I can guarantee I didn't say go away. <laughs> I think he was trying to wake me up. It was weird. I became angry. I thought, you bastard. And I thought, I followed him back into his room. When we got locked inside, I panicked because I thought about him ringing my father. I didn't know which punishment was going to be worse. I thought he was going to ring the old man in the middle of the night. I also thought I had Dallin's measure as I had shown him that I wasn't scared of him. He told me to drop my pyjama pants and as always, I had to pull the top up over my shoulders. He then told me to bend over the bed. When I leaned over the bed, when my knees didn't touch the ground, I was just hanging there. He wasn't a lot stronger than me, but he was bigger. And I was in a bit of an awkward position. He raped me, and at the time I felt powerless. I couldn't figure out how to get out of that position. I managed to get my feet on the floor, got a bit of leverage and kicked him back sideways. Down and lost his footing. Uh, I got up and he fell on the floor. While he was still on the floor, I tied up my pyjama pants real tight and started abusing him. I went to leave the room, as I did. I told him I'd tell my parents. When I got up, I was pretty angry, pretty upset. Probably one of the only times I've ever cried. He started crying, and he was sitting on the edge of his desk with his head in his hands and asked me to wait a minute. I walked out of the room and I said, you bastard. Then I started walking back into the room and started belting him, and I wouldn't stop. He was crying. Floor, and I was so angry for me, angry for the other kids out of the room. about what I do when the door because my plan was to attack to come out and 
The next morning, Brother Nangle opened the door and my father was standing there too. The first thing I did was took a swing at Brother Nangle. He was a pretty tall man I missed. My father grabbed my hold and said, Grab what little gear I had and drove back to the district with my mother. On the way home, on the way there, I told him what happened and it had been happening. I told him I was angry. My father pulled up the car at Scar and uh, and then again at when we finally arrived at the West, he locked me in a room in the pub. The next day I was still angry and they took me over to Briley Psychiatric Unit in Warrnambool. I told the Briley uh, people they didn't believe. I caught another brother there and one of our colleagues sexually abusing a pig. Eventually I was expelled from one of our in 1976 after beating up Father O'Brien, who used to beat kids up. He was always picking on kids in strife. One night I was in bed and the boy next to me in the dormitory was crying in the early hours of the morning. I pulled back the sheets. He was covered in blood. I asked him what had happened and he said Father O'Brien did it. I just kicked Father O'Brien's door in and laid into him. I went back to my bed and two prefects come and got me in the middle of the night, dragged me to O'Brien's room where they beat me with a fan belt until I was bleeding. I suppose by that stage my used by date was up. I had nowhere to run, so I walked, grabbed what I had left in my life and uh, walked out of the school gates. I was later grabbed by the police or someone in authority and take it back to the hotel where my father gave me another flogging. I never lived at home again. I remember reading the paper, well, criminal proceedings, I remember reading the paper one morning in 94, 95, I was running a pub in Melbourne, and I read about Brother Dowdle being charged with a number of uh, child sexual offences. I was witness at those proceedings and gave evidence in the Melbourne Magistrates Court. A number of victims had given evidence before me, I'd been in the box for 15 or 20 minutes when Dowlin's lawyer asked for an adjournment. After the adjournment, Dowlin's lawyer told the court that Brother Dowlin decided to plead guilty. Dowlin pled guilty to 16 offences, uh, and one against me, and was sentenced to nine years and eight months, of which he appealed later. Civil proceedings. In 97, a guy from Slater and Gordon rang me and said he had a cheque for me. He told me it was compensation for a criminal court case. I said, oh, I didn't want to know about it. He told me the church had uh, given it to Slater and Gordon. He told me that if I didn't take the money, the church uh, wouldn't be pay him and the firm wouldn't get their fee. I was given 30,000 of this. I received 20 of it, 10 went to the lawyer, and I gave it all away because it was blood money. It was money that people in the Catholic community had put on the collection plate with good intentions. I gave it away to homeless people and people who were in need. In my, in my mind, it did some good. Despite the abuse I experienced at St Patrick's and witnessed elsewhere, I managed to do well at school and love writing literature. 
I ride every day now. I get up at four o'clock every morning and I ride right now before starting my day. It gets rid of all the garbage out of my head and it gives me an opportunity to try and do some good things. I've written a couple of books. The first one was my experiences with uh, Catholic clergy, which I eventually destroyed. It would have been wrong. It was a wrong time to publish it and it would have embarrassed a lot of people. I'm the mayor of the Murrable Shire, uh, but when I became mayor, I was uh, reluctant and humiliated by the process of my history. I know there are things that I did in my life that I'll never be proud of. It's been really a really difficult journey in terms of self-respect. I've been extraordinarily lucky uh, as a mayor because people do respect me, and I find it embarrassing that people, uh, no matter where I go, see me as someone that's fairly straightforward and honest, and I'll fight for the little guy. Even today, whilst it could be incredibly humiliating and embarrassing to be sexually assaulted by Ted, but let me tell you something about Ted. He goes to bed every night with a gorilla. He'd be getting plenty. Don't worry about that. I've never let it go. I've never let it get to me, and I never let it will. I never let it will because the fortunate part about what happened is I had an opportunity to uh, show him how angry I was and how angry I was going to be. I had my day in court. I told him what I thought of him. I, I told him what I thought of the things that he did. About six or seven years ago, I heard that uh, Paul Mangle had been made a spiritual advisor to St Patrick's College. I was pretty angry, and for good reason. I went to the school and met with who I thought was the principal that turned out to be a staff member and told him that I would expose his story. I was working as a journalist at the time in one of my own newspapers. He wouldn't let me speak to Brother Nangle and at the end of the year Nangle wasn't listed as a spiritual advisor for St Patrick's. The Catholic Church itself has done nothing in relative terms. I'm still a Catholic, believe it or not. Moving towards justice has done more than they'll ever do. This problem is far more complex than money. It hasn't gone away and it's still happening. Your Honour, could I uh, seek your indulgence to make a short statement? I don't know why this experience hardened me as opposed to breaking me. And I don't know why the residual effects have strengthened my resolve towards injustice. I would suggest that having the capacity to deal with the incident at the moment made an enormous difference in terms of dealing with it later on. It took me a while to get there, but I've had a great life. I have a great wife and children. I have successful businesses that allow me to help other people, even if only in a small way, and a privileged position in my community. I've got nothing to complain about. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. That's what it's about. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. Coming here today is not about where you nor should it be. There are a lot of people from this horrendous system that have managed to put the past behind them where the good things in their lives have outweighed the bad. We won't see those people. The people who did these crimes were your sales reps in a system that gives respect for title over substance. They were weak and disturbed human beings, and I use the term lightly. Catholicism is still a great metaphor for human guidance. It's a human element that's lost its way. I still follow the principles of Catholicism. I don't go to church. I just choose to cut out the middleman and go straight to the boss. <laughs> the Catholic Church is like any other organisational business. The buck has to stop somewhere. And in Australia, it's George Powell. He may not have the intestinal fortitude or the ability to see beyond his own vanity, but it's his ambition that got him there and it'll take his humility to get him out of there. Time will tell if George can find an answer to the courage, an answer to the courage you'll bear witness to throughout these proceedings. You cannot seek atonement when you're still in denial. I think it's time George Pell stopped looking in the mirror and had a look out the window. Whilst he turns the legal defence into spaghetti, Rome's still burning. There is a real opportunity here, and I'd like to thank the, uh, the Commission and all the people that make this thing work, especially those people that work behind the scenes. There is a real opportunity to make changes here. Some of them may even save a life. I feel for the lives that have been destroyed and I grieve for those that have been lost. 
We are a community and a member of a broader community, and we simply have to stand up and be counted. And that's why we're all here today. The Catholic Church hierarchy needs to do the same. Thank you. Questions of Mr. Tatchell. Thank you, Mr. Tatchell. Thanks for your statement, and uh, you are now excused. Um, Your Honour, I call Stephen Woods. Would you take an oath on the Bible or an affirmation? Uh, the affirmation, please. Affirmation. Would you repeat after me, please? I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly. I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give in this royal commission. That the evidence I shall give in this royal commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Take a seat, please. Yes, Ms. Finnett. Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, would you tell the Royal Commission your full name? I'm sorry, I can't hear you properly. Would you tell the Royal Commission your full name? I'm Stephen Thomas Woods. And, Mr. Woods, you've made a statement dated the 23rd of April? Sure did. And are the contents of that true and correct? Sorry, pardon? Are the contents of that true and correct? Yes, they are. I tender the statement. It will become Exhibit 2821. Thank you, Your Honour. Um, I invite you to read your statement, Mr Woods. Thank you. The statement made by me accurately sets out the evidence that I am prepared to give to the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. The statement is true and correct to the best of my knowledge and belief. Where direct speech is referred to in the statement, it is provided in words or words to the effect of those which were used to the best of my recollection. My full name is Stephen Thomas Woods. I was born in 1961 and I'm currently 53 years old. I was born in Bungaree, Victoria, which is a town to the east of Ballarat, and my family was well known in Ballarat. I'm the youngest of seven children. My parents were Catholics and wanted to have a large family, which they did. My dad was a policeman, and he and my mum were very involved in the Catholic Church. Dad worked very hard. Supporting seven kids on a policeman's wage was very, very difficult. My eldest brother trained as a Christian brother for a year. Every good Catholic family wants one of their sons to go into the vocation, as they called it. He was kicked out after 11 months. My brother told me this was because he kept questioning the Christian brothers and their leaders, and because he would not conform to their expectations of capitulation. The year my brother went to train as a Christian brother was the last year that brother Edward Vernon Dowlin was at the Edmund Rice Centre at Amberley. Brother Dowlin later abused me as a child. I commenced my schooling at St John's Primary School, Bungaree, from prep to grade three. My brother had some behavioural issues and Dad had heard that Brother Best, a teacher at St. Olympia's Primary School, was very good at controlling boys, so he decided to send my brother and I to St. Olympia's in 1970. I started in Grade 4 at St. Olympia's in Ballarat East. In 1972, I was 11 years old, and in Grade 6, it was the first week of school, Brother Robert Best 
who was my class teacher and also the school headmaster, started putting his fingers down the back of my pants and playing between my buttocks. This occurred in a classroom at St. Olympia's down the back of the room whilst we were both sitting on the art desk. Looking back, I think I knew even as a young boy that I was gay. I believe that Best got wind of this somehow and he wanted to know all the details. I was 12 at the time and Best had me and another 12-year-old boy enact a sexual act in front of him. Best told us to strip down to our underpants, hold each other and reach around and grab each other's buttocks. We had to rub up against each other and Best knelt down to see if we got an erection. He was playing with our genitals through our underpants while he did that. He then sent the other boy out and he told me that I was bad, that I was evil, and that I deserved what he did to me. He said, this is your fault. I heard these words from him over and over and over. Every time he molested me, every time Best had me stand in his lilac painted office at St. Lepius, he would get me to strip partially and he would say, okay, only lift your shirt halfway this time. Or he'd tell me to drop my pants a little bit or a lot. Then he would say, no, this time you are very bad. This is your fault. You need to take your pants right down and your shirt right up. Best would be sitting behind his desk while I was undressing. While this was happening, I was always wondering why he was moving and shuffling behind his desk. Now I recognize as an adult is that while I was doing this in his office, Best was masturbating. After he had sated himself, he used to lay me across his knees and smack me. He also used to feel my buttocks and groin between my legs before he smacked me. He always had a good grope. Best had me reenact the same story after school a number of times in his lilac covered office. I distinctly remember that this happened often at least once a month while I was in grade six. The thing with Best was that he appeared to parents to be good with the boys and could control their behavior. But we were just scared shitless because he was so malevolent towards us. You had to be supplicant to his demands to satisfy his desires and do what he wanted. Best always used physical violence. I remember specifically once being slammed against a brick wall near the grade six door by Best. He held me by my neck, almost choking me. A couple of hours after this, he had me in his office, molesting me, reiterating that it was my fault that I was to blame. I was a good student and reasonably intelligent, so I didn't receive additional beatings by Best for not learning properly as I witnessed other boys did. To the parents best played on his ability to be seen as good and firm with the boys. In that era, that still counted for something. What my mum and dad didn't know was that his control over us was through graphic violence and utter fear. Often the violence perpetrated by Best was malicious and gratuitous, and it occurred on the spur of the moment. You were never sure when it was going to happen. Something out of the blue could make him go off. But then again, he wasn't the only teacher who behaved this way. (coughs) Brothers Dowlin and Fitzgerald were also notorious amongst the students for the physical abuse they perpetrated on students, which I witnessed on many occasions. My brother was two years ahead of me at St. Olympia's. Once he was beaten so viciously by Best that I remember seeing bruises all down his legs that night when we were going to bed. My mum and dad didn't say anything other than that my brother must have been playing up. 
This is a disturbing memory for a child to have to carry all his life. In 1973, I started at St. Patrick's College in Ballarat, as per the, the family tradition. All my elder brothers had gone to St. Patrick's, and my uncle was a Christian brother who had taught there for many years. I was a day student at St. Patrick's. Brother Dowland was a teacher at St. Patrick's, and he was in charge of the junior boarders dormitory. Talk about Dracula being in charge of the blood bank. I had Dallin as a French teacher. At the time, Dallin was probably in his mid-twenties or early thirties. I had a shocking time at St. Patrick's. Dallin had his way of sending you down the back of the classroom for any spurious reason. There he bent me backwards over a desk while having his hands in his belt and he felt my penis and testicles through my pants groping me. All the while he berated me, my family, and especially my brother who had gone to the Christian Brothers Seminary. Dowland said my brother was someone who couldn't make it. I was told by a member of the Student Representative Council at the time that an official complaint was made by the Student Representative Council against Dowland because of his vicious outbursts. The complaint was made to Brother Paul Nangle, the headmaster of St. Patrick's. The student representative council was disbanded as a result of the complaint and one of the students who made the complaint was taken down to the back of the school by Dowlin and Rowe, but I've subsequently found out it was Brother Barr, and he was viciously beaten that night. The violence seemed more concentrated at St. Lepi's because there was a smaller group of students and a smaller schoolyard. So I saw it happening more often. St. Patrick's was more spread out, but the brothers used the leather strap far more often. This berating, putting down and molesting by Dowling went on for two years. My dad was on the cut. Gerald Ridsdale. Father Ridsdale was well known to my family. Initially, I felt comfortable in confiding to him. I confessed I was sexually experimenting. Ridsdale responded by asking me for more and more graphic details. As I was giving him the specifics, he came up behind me and groped me. Within half an hour of talking with Ridsdale in an upstairs room at the presbytery, he had me sucking his penis and feeling his ass. He was feeling my penis and he had my pants down. Then he drove me to a set of toilets around Lake Wenderee. He got me out of the car and he dragged me into a cubicle, made me pull down my pants and he anally raped me. He was about two or three times my size. Ridsdale kept saying, I would love to have you in a bed. Can you get a bed? I'd love to go to bed with you. At the time, Ridsdale would have been in his late 40s or 50s. I remember that car he had, a Datsun 240K. At the time, I sort, sort of thought that this was what homosexuality was, that this was just the way it was. 
About a week or so after this incident, Ridsdale called me around to, Ridsdale called around to our house to see my parents and asked if he could speak to me. My mum said that he could take me out. And he took me to the same location as the week before and raped me again. In Form 2 after the rapes by Ridsdale, things went downhill for me at school. One day I was accused by a teacher of making abusive phone calls to her and that just really sealed for me that St. Patrick's was not the school for me. I hated the school and I used to cut class all the time. In 1974 I went to Ballarat High School. I only passed year 9 and failed years 10 and 11. I then tried the School of Mines and Industries in Ballarat, but only made it two-thirds of the way through year 12. As soon as I turned 18, I left school and went to Melbourne. I couldn't wait to get away and get out of Ballarat. Later on, about 1976, I came across Ridsdale saying Mass in Horsham. I had gone up to receive the Eucharist, being a typical Catholic. When I saw it was Ridsdale giving it out, I just refused and turned around and left. My dad was fairly strict in my childhood. He worked a lot and he struggled to cope with the demands of having seven children. You couldn't talk to him about anything. My parents just didn't even talk about sex. Nobody did. I wasn't told anything, and I didn't even know what my testicles were. So in relation to the abuse, I was very much alone. At the time, I did tell a friend about the abuse. He told me that Brother Bess had fucked him, and I said, yeah, he got me. That was all we said, and we moved on. I didn't want to tell him I was gay, as I was embarrassed at that point. In 1990, my brother Anthony was dying of AIDS. And my mum said he should come home to Ballarat and she would nurse him. My mother told me Anthony had told her that Ridsdale had raped him. It was also around this time that I found out that Anthony had been abused by Ridsdale. My mum told me that she actually remembers the day when my mother, brother Anthony came home from a school camp and said to her, Mum, Father Ridsdale made me sleep in a tent with him. She remembers, him, she remembers saying to him, Oh, that was nice of him, dear, wasn't it? She had no idea what, he really had, what had really happened. Anthony has now passed away. It wasn't, it wasn't until Ridsdale was first charged in 1993 that I talked about my sexual abuse with, with my mum. No, I'll carry on. Absolutely. But thank you. It wasn't until Ridgell was first charged in 1993 that I talked about my sexual abuse with my mum. Broken Rights had put some information in the local paper, which my mum saw. She said to me, something happened with you, didn't it? Were you molested by Ridsdale? As soon as she said that word, molested, it was a trigger for me. I told her that I'd been molested by him, and she believed me instantly. I then went to the police, 
and made a statement in June 1993. After I told my mum about Ridgedale, I went to the Ngunnawading Community Police Station in Melbourne and made a statement about the abuse by Ridgedale, Best and Dowlin. This was in about June 93, and it took several months to recall all the details and finalise the statement. In 1994, Ridgedale was charged with abusing many boys, including me. It seemed to me that the evidence at Ridgedale was overwhelming. And I think Ridsdale pleaded guilty to all the charges. Ridsdale was sentenced to 18 years in prison with a non-parole period of 15 years. In 1994, Dowlin was charged with abusing 22 complainants, including myself. After Dowlin was charged, I received a telephone call one day from a woman who I believed was a private detective. We had a conversation of the following to the following effect. I said, hello, I'm Steve Woods. She said, I'm working for Dowlin's lawyers in Geelong. I said, is this about Brother Dowlin? She said, yes, yes, for Brother Dowlin. We wanted to know how you're feeling about the case. I said, what do you mean you want to know how I'm feeling? She said, well, you know, we're checking to see if you still want to go through with the charges. I swore at her and hung up. Following the call, I rang Sergeant Blair Smith, who was conducting the prosecution against Dowlin. I understand that he rang the person who called me and told him to cease and desist immediately or it would be contempt of court. He was outraged. <coughs> so was I. Dowlin's lawyers hired private detectives to go around and harass victims, including me. A couple of other victims of Dowlin told me that they had received similar phone calls. Dowlin was awarded 22 separate trials, so I thought that there was a high probability of him getting off all the charges. I wrote a letter to the Office of Public Prosecutions saying this is unacceptable. The OPP called me and I met with them. <clears throat> After this meeting, the OPP withdrew the charges for all 22 complainants and resubmitted the charges for the first nine complainants in three groups of different charges. I was informed by police that Dowland pleaded guilty to some charges, including the charges against me. The police also informed me that the OPP dropped all the buggery charges. In July 1996, Dowlin was sentenced to nine years and eight months, with a non-parole period of six years. Dowlin appealed the sentence against the sentence, and it was reduced to six years and nine months imprisonment, with a non-parole period of four years. A token amount. I was told by the solicitors from the OPP that the Christian brothers would have got little change from half a million dollars defending Dowland against the charges that were laid against him. <laughs> to me, this is palpably repugnant. About the same time, Best was charged with abusing five boys, including me. When it went to court, Best was defended by a QC. After an initial hearing, a judge ordered separate trials for each victim. This meant that the jury heard only the evidence from one victim in each trial. Best was acquitted in relation, relation to the charges of abusing me. The criminal proceedings were an ordeal. I became clinically depressed and suicidal. To see this man who had committed such brutal and vicious sex crimes against me get off due to legal word games was one of the worst betrayals of my life. I remember that the jury took five days to come to a decision. And by that time, I was in bed at home and I couldn't even come to court. My beautiful mother and my sister went to every 
day. No. The charges against best. It reinforced to me that it was not my fault. And I wanted to help other men come forward. Secondly, one of the pillars of the Catholic Church stands on is its public reputation. And I wanted to highlight the systemic corruption within the church. Finally, I wanted to expose the horrific cover-up perpetrated by the senior members of the Catholic Church who I believe knew about Ridsdale, Best and Dowlin for many years but chose to do nothing about it. After this, people started to contact my family or me or broken rights. Usually they contacted Broken Rights, who gave them my number. As the victims came forward, it was quite literally like the dam bursting. In 1996, I hosted a public forum at the Ballarat Civic Hall, paid for by my father. The forum included victims, victims' families, social workers, workers and police. About 200 people attended. Bishop Mulcairns and other members of the Catholic Church were invited, but nobody from the Catholic Church attended. We called for the resignation of Bishop Mulcairns due to his knowledge of the sexual abuse that he was instrumental in covering up, and the resolution was passed. Bishop Mulcairns resigned not long after this forum. I refused to go through towards healing. It was, quite an em it was at quite an embryonic stage when I first made my complaint to the police. But I had already heard that the church was screwing people over. I didn't want to go back to the Catholic Church. You wouldn't go back to a dog that has bitten you. I did receive some victims. I did receive some victims of crime compensation. And I also had a civil claim against the Catholic Church. The claim commenced in 1994 and settled in 1997, two weeks before it was supposed to go to trial. Out of the amount I was awarded, $30,000 went to my solicitors and some went to Medicare. I trained as a teacher and started to work in 1990 and I trained as a teacher and started work in 2004 and stopped going and stopped to go back to university in 2010 to obtain my masters in literacy education I subsequently had to stop my studies after another breakdown and I was too tired and too exhausted to continue I have now stopped teaching at all because I have developed chronic arthritis and I need both hips replaced. I've already had my lip one, left hip done, and I am, have, am to have my right hip operation very shortly. Since the abuse, I've had a repetitive voice in the back of my mind, which was, has continued to reinforce the lies that Best and Dowlin had told me, that I was bad, that I was evil. My self-esteem was utterly shattered and ruined. 
I've also had a hyper-awareness of potential threats, which has only deepened my anxieties. My brothers and sisters, who weren't assaulted, did very well at school and went on to university straight after school, but I didn't. I used to wonder why, but now I know. Anger has been won. Anger has been one of my overarching emotions through this whole time. It keeps me going, although sometimes it's unchecked and I've gotten into trouble with it. When Bess got off my charges relating to me, I had a total breakdown. I became suicidal, but luckily I had a good doctor who recognized it and sent me to a psychiatrist. I also have complete, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I have been to many counselors and psychiatrists over the years, good and bad ones, some indifferent and some average. The best one was the last one I saw. She was a clinical psychologist whose background was in treating victims of child sexual abuse. She was brilliant at joining the dots that I couldn't. And making sense of some of the more obscure feelings and attitudes I had. That is, why I felt so bad and down about myself. Why I kept pushing and then falling and pushing and falling. It's difficult and expensive for me to get psychological counselling. I also started grinding my teeth after Ridsdale raped me. And I have no money to get my dental treatment, to get any dental treatment, including to fix a broken mouth plate and to stop me grinding my teeth. I have no idea what I'm going to do about that. The fact is that I have no career no solid relationship, no fixed address is indicative of the effect of the sexual abuse upon me. Some family and friends have been very, very generous in supporting me, but it should not be their responsibility to bear the consequences for someone else's crimes. This is a heinous situation for someone of my potential abilities to find myself in. I remember grieving for my childhood. I distinctly remember a period where I grieved for the young kid that I was and now I feel like I'm grieving for my lost career and my lost life. And I often feel like I have no future. <laughs> my parents were utterly shattered. Shattered by the revolution, by the revelations of abuse to their three sons. Their faith and their trust in the church was destroyed. They had entrusted their most precious gifts, their things to them, the church, and the church abused them. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> After my father died, my mum told me that he had at one point sat in the driveway of their house in Ballarat in the car with the engine idling and with a shotgun full of ammunition on his lap. Apparently, he wanted to take out his anger on those he felt were responsible. Dad was a very good shot, and it would have been a massacre. 
I'm glad he didn't do it. But at times I feel like maybe he should have. My family have been unbelievably and incredibly supportive. My beautiful, lovely mother went public with me in 1996 and went on television and radio in Ballarat as well as in the local paper. Mum stood by her children with her absolute strength. She paid the price though told me that the local Catholic community ostracised her terribly in the last years of her life. My mother was a part of a woman's group. My mother knew that some of the other women who attended, uh, knew some of the other women who attended and were friends of hers, who had sons who were also abused. After my mother went, many of these so-called friends from the women's group stopped calling her. She lost her belief in the Catholic Church after nearly 70 years of being a devout Catholic. My sisters and brothers have told me that they absolutely despise the church. My family were heavily involved in the Catholic church for three generations. Our faith has now been lost. <sighs> My uncle was a long-standing and respected Christian brother from the age of 14 until he died at the age of 90. When my mother, his sister, told him that his nephews had been sexually abused by the church that he had given his life to, he was shattered. Although I have stopped teaching and now I'm a, dis now I'm a disability pensioner, I will go around Australia and help people who have been victims of child sexual abuse wherever I can. I speak publicly. I support victims who are going to court and who are seeking redress. I attempt to help those victims begin the healing process in whatever way I can. I am a consultant and supporter of survivors network of those abused by priests and of broken rights. Six of my former classmates from St. Olympias and St. Patrick's have committed suicide or died prematurely. Six, such chronic sexual abuse in the Ballarat community has led to a large number of men who are not able to be productive members of society and in effect have beca become either emotional, social or financial burdens upon the community. The Catholic Church needs to take responsibility for the actions and the ongoing cover-ups of clergy who sexually abused children. There needs to be immediate, proper care of survivors to stop the premature deaths that are continuing to happen within the Ballarat Diocese. The Royal Commission is helping survivors feel empowered. I hope that finally the Catholic Church in particular may be held accountable for its sex crimes. We have the chance now to change all of society. We had better take it. No questions of the witness, Your Honour. There's one matter I wish to raise after he's been excused. Is there anyone else who wishes to ask a question? Thank you, Mr Woods. Thank you for your statement and your evidence.